Hello everyone, it's me, Tom, certified Sugma male, and I think we need to talk about who is animation really for? Is it for me? Is it for you? Is it for... Who, who is it for? Is animation just for kids? Does there need to be more of a focus on animation for adults? Does animation lose something when it doesn't conform to the typical expectation of cartoons being just for kids. Well, if I'm speaking strictly to the community that is around animation, I'm not making any big, bold statements by saying animation is for everyone. By just acknowledging that animation is a medium for storytelling in general, for any, uh, all, all people, everybody. Any story for any audience can be done through the medium of animation. And to those of us in the space, this isn't a piping hot take. This is a very cold take, to be honest. It's been on ice for so long, it's got freezer burn. I'm not serving you anything that you don't already know. If anything, it's the same dish you've already had and you're probably tired of hearing about this. Because to all of us, this is common knowledge. Which is why it's frustrating when you have people that stumble onto these videos or onto this channel and they struggle through this lens that cartoons are for kids and only for kids rather than acknowledging the depth of these stories that are created by people who have been dedicating their lives to understanding storytelling and don't get paid as much as their live action counterparts people who struggle with the idea that there is anything beyond the surface level to begin with and any deeper analysis made is just the speaker projecting their own worldviews onto the text that doesn't actually reflect anything that they're talking about. What might surprise you, though, is the fact that adults, they care about animation. Adults want to watch animation. Did you ever wonder why Space Ghost Coast to Coast, the first home-produced cartoon on Cartoon Network, ended up on Adult Swim once the channel actually had a pretty decent backlog of programming? Because even though Space Ghost Coast to Coast wasn't especially raunchy or inappropriate, it appealed to older audiences. It appealed more to adults than it appealed to children. So when they started making a bunch of cartoons that kids really liked, they're like, hey, yo, let's give you to the big boys. And if you go back and look at shows like Johnny Bravo, Dexter's Lab, Rocco's Modern Life, that one show that doesn't have a showrunner, there is definitely an intention to appeal to older audiences as well as children. Oh yeah? Well, here's your mom! Part of this was a reaction to a pretty tame era of animation prior, something that is clearly a part of the joke in Space Ghost and the fact they're taking Hanna-Barbera characters that were once pretty tame and sanitized and then they're bringing them into a surreal talk show. And there's also a fact that shows like The Simpsons and adult animation in general was starting to become really popular. So across the entire industry of Western animation, they were trying to capitalize on that, and capitalize they did. Cartoons in the 90s and 2000s are a lot like pro wrestling around that time compared to now, in the sense that it was once a mainstream phenomenon, and now it is struggling to reach a broader audience. But similar to wrestling, there have been breakthrough moments very recently. Rick and Morty had a Simpsons-like spike in popularity. It's kind of died down now, but I've also had adult family members come up to me and ask about Steven Universe or The Owl House. Both Avatar The Last Airbender and Infinity Train dominated their respected streaming services only a year apart from one another, which is all evidence that adults are watching cartoons and they want to watch cartoons, making them a viable market for animation. But the difference is there isn't the same eagerness to capitalize on that wave now as there was back then, despite these trends being very obvious. And you know what? Screw being objective. I'ma insert my opinion here. I think it's really bad for animation as a whole to do what these networks are doing in alienating an entire demographic that is eagerly wanting to support these shows because what's happening now is these networks who produce animated shows are throwing those shows away because they appeal to too broad of an audience. In recent memory, beloved cartoons have been facing the chopping block and fans of said cartoons are left wondering why. It's not always a situation of just underperforming that causes these studios and networks to cut their losses, burn off whatever's left, and wipe their hands clean to try again. The problem isn't that these shows aren't popular, that they're too expensive to make, or even that they pose a liability the way that many try to speculate. The issue that keeps coming up is branding. Who is the show for? Is it bringing in the audience we want? Does it reflect how we as a brand want to be perceived? Questions that you would think wouldn't matter 
once you've got the green light for your cartoon. It's on TV, and there are people who love it. You'd think if there's an audience, there's a demand, and that's a straight line to success. But what happens when that opportunity is treated as an issue that can't be solved? People are perceiving this show, and they aren't perceiving it how we want it to be perceived, and perceptions are hard to change. So even though we're making money, it's best to just scrap this whole thing entirely and start again. What happens when Dana Terrace is told, despite her show being a cultural phenomenon reaching a broad and passionate audience, that's not something the network is interested in keeping around. Since the show's audience skews a bit older, it relies on continuity and doesn't reflect the brands that they're going for. What happens when Infinity Train is moved to HBO Max to appeal to a broader demographic and then succeeds beyond expectations on that assignment, only for Owen Dennis to be told the show is being cut short because the perspective stopped catering towards children. Even when there are plenty of shows on HBO Max that don't appeal to children, why is it on HBO Max if it still needs to be for children? Close enough appeals to 30 year olds who need to do their taxes. Wait, fuck, I need to file my taxes. You have massive audiences, a huge group of consumers that want to support your product, buy your streaming service, and buy merch associated with these shows who are just being hung out to dry. They can't give you financial support, and because you keep screwing them over, they're growing to resent you. And this all comes from the idea that we're making cartoons, and if we're making cartoons, they gotta be for kids, and if they aren't for kids, then what the f*** are we making cartoons for? Grown-ups don't wanna watch cartoons? Hold on a second! What happened? I used to go in the strip club and say, you gotta turn it to Cartoon Network right now. I can't watch Cartoon Network anymore. Because it turns into the baby channel now! The problem here is we're past the point of pretending adults don't care about animation. Why do you think that Big Mouth is so popular? Why do you think Rick and Morty, every young adult who smokes weed is like, yeah, I'm Pickle Rick, that's me. I identify with being a pickle. Why do you think shows like Invincible and Arcane are so popular even beyond the animation community? Whatever that means. I actually don't know what the animation community is. People just keep saying it and I just go along like I pretend like I know what it is. I don't even know what that f Kids are not the primary or only audience when it comes to animation. There are plenty of adults who want animation. These shows prove that there's a market for adults wanting to see animated content. Shows that appeal to all ages are better for the medium as a whole, both critically and financially, and those are the shows that define generations. For example, if we go back to about 10 years ago, and we look at this network for cartoons, this is entirely blown out. We look at this network for cartoons, and things were going downhill, and they were kind of stagnating for a while, and then suddenly there was a huge uptick. There's this, this big, this big arrow up. And what happened here at this point where the trajectory changed was there was a new show. And what was that new show? It's your time. Come on, grab your friend. At the last turn of the decade, Cartoon Network wasn't doing great. None of the animation world was doing great if we're being completely honest. And it wasn't that they weren't making good shows, but it had been a while since a cartoon had really knocked it out of the park and made a legitimate impact with broader audiences. Sure, there was Chowder, Flapjack, Toll, Drama Island, but as popular as those shows were with the existing audience of Cartoon Network, they didn't have a show that was creating a noticeable expansion for their audience. That was until Adventure Adventure Time came forward and created a massive spike in popularity for the network and animation as a whole. Adventure Time brought a lot of eyes to regular show, primed a lot of people for Gravity Falls, and was partly responsible for the development of Steven Universe. But most importantly, it was extremely commercially successful for long enough to set Western animation on track for a lot of great stories. It was the titan of its time, and why was it such a cultural titan? Because it appealed to audiences of all ages. Adventure Time, by welcoming an older audience on top of the target demographic, was able to reach a new level of importance in society as a whole. Even though there was a lot of childish nonsense, the world of Adventure Time felt grounded. The pieces of the puzzle were oddly shaped and wildly colored, but they didn't float in space hoping the audience would be too young to notice. Actions had consequences. Solving one problem could create new problems. There were heartbreaks, messy situations. The history of the world was grim, and the perspective was nihilistic. Even with a candy kingdom, a magical wizard, and a world of princesses for the protagonist to choose from, it wasn't a fairy tale. Like that's ever gonna happen. Oh, I love it.
It was an absurd and extraordinary world that was both comfortably and disturbingly similar to our own, while respecting the intelligence of whoever was on the other side of the screen. Which is exactly what made Adventure Time more broadly consumable than any of the cartoons immediately preceding it. Beyond being just another, whoa, they showed this to kids, I won't lie, a big upside for the network with this type of cartoon was the fact that Adventure Time has plenty of episodes that are self-contained. For the prime run of the show, only a handful of episodes require prior knowledge of previous events or lore to understand, and usually if they did, at least early on, they would be part of a special event where only a few episodes needed to be aired in order to make sense. Strict continuity is a big factor for networks when it comes to their attitude towards the show, and is part of the reason given why cartoons that skew older tend to get the axe, because those shows tend to be very reliant on continuity, and that makes it tough to introduce new viewers through reruns. But we gotta be real, the age of cable is and has been on the decline. The age of streaming is greatly on the rise. Every major studio has access to a streaming service. Why are we canceling popular shows instead of using them to draw new customers onto your service? Especially if the audience is trending towards adults, because I don't know many six-year-olds with a credit card. The platform that these stories are best suited for are also where the audience for those stories are going for content, and these networks have those platforms to utilize. Am I crazy? Is there a reason why we are still in 2022 judging the merit of cartoons on their ability to succeed on cable, because that merit is the main difference between the shows getting canned and being game-changing hits like Adventure Time. The thing about Adventure Time is it is greatly a product of its time. The weird so random humor that was still funny in the early 2010s, the recurring nice guy references, and also being cable friendly are all aspects that served Adventure Time well for airing when it did. But in the process, it also dared to go into darker themes and tell more complex stories that would shape the direction of animation over the last 10 years. And unlike 10 years ago, now it makes sense that cartoons should be less focused on being cable friendly and more focused on being streaming friendly, appealing to the binge culture a lot of us have adapted to with continuous stories, and streaming seems to be most effective when not trying to micro-focus on demographics. And I'd actually argue that in the context of Adventure Time, the ability to appeal to audiences young and old may have made it more relevant, but doing so at that time also created an issue. The points where the show committed to long-term storytelling, especially later in its run, were highlights of the cartoon. But similar to what we'd see in Steven Universe, there did come a point where story events being broken up by one-off episodes episodes did start to have a negative effect if the overarching story is what you were watching for. And vice versa, the expectation to know the continuity of the show took away confidence in the viewer's ability to jump in at any point. If I turn on Cartoon Network and Adventure Time is on, will it be a fun little story about a candy person doing something naughty? Or is it gonna be an exploration deeper into the complex lore of Ooh that requires 8 episodes of context to understand? And if you look at the shows now that Adventure Time inspired and networks are straying away from, there is at least an honest expectation for how you should consume the story because they're more committed to that long-term storytelling so you know if you want to watch The Owl House, you're gonna need to start from the beginning and watch in order or else you're gonna be lost. If you want to watch Infinity Train, you gotta watch them as books at least. You can get away with watching season 3 before season 1, you might miss some references here and there, but you'll be able to understand what's going on and see the story play out as intended. However, the problem that it would have on cable is if your introduction to Infinity Train was through catching reruns, you would be totally lost. There was a girl talking to a dog, then some other kids were mourning a gorilla, one of them apparently murdered. Now the first girl is made chrome, now she's not chrome, but there's some old lady covered in numbers. Apparently numbers are important. What is going on with the numbers? Are they good? Are they bad? Which is exactly why television networks are opposed to these shows. Because they have to accommodate their schedules for the fact that these episodes are meant to be consumed in a particular way. Cable is not an on-demand service. The TV comes on and whatever's there you watch or you change the channel until you want to watch what's there. What this means is content has to be formulaic and inconsequential, but still managed to be compelling or entertaining enough to hold viewership. Today this isn't as much of a standard because now we have streaming. This limitation doesn't have to apply to every cartoon. I personally am not opposed 
opposed to airing 22 hours of Teen Titans Go if it means they're also going to produce good story-driven cartoons, even if they only air these story-driven shows on premiere and then slap the rest on a streaming service. But it feels like networks just want to go all or nothing, and maybe I'm missing something. I'm not someone who is overseeing a corporation that is responsible for producing income. However, I have invested an unhealthy amount of time to looking at cartoons, how they succeed, why they succeed, when they succeed, and I think that throwing shows away that are critically acclaimed, drawing large passionate audiences, and have the ability to positively affect the landscape of animation overall, I think that's a mistake. In an attempt to finalize things because I feel like this video is mostly me ranting, my point is ultimately that Adventure Time is the perfect example of why these shows are so important. Shows that do the things that make their appeal more universal. It's not about adults being able to be included in animation. Even as there are more and more shows coming out that I honestly really struggle to identify with, there are still plenty of animated stories for me, especially with there being other platforms that want to show the diversity of the medium. And the problem is more the frustration in succeeding and still having there be people who can decide on a whim that you still lose. Even after Adventure Time set a precedent for all of Western animation, that you could put more intelligent and emotionally deep stories on a children's network and have them be commercially successful across the board. And the demand has not only grown over time, but it proved that cartoons like that have a use. And I feel like the popularity of Adventure Time is kind of a you needed to be there type of thing, because in hindsight, Avatar got a lot more appreciation after the facts than when it aired regular show and other Cartoon Network shows from that period were boosted by Adventure Time. So in the context of history, the explosive reaction to Jake the Dog, Finn the Human, and all the friends they made along the way just doesn't feel as significant as it was seeing the immediate before and after. And for that reason, I think it's easy for people to forget to give Adventure Time its flowers, and that's kind of sad. It was the most game-changing cartoon of the millennium for its ambition and its ability to commercially and critically succeed with all demographics. To have that not be appreciated in the fiction that stands to follow that example and tell stories from the heart that are resonating with people around the world, it just feels like a big mistake. Maybe this isn't as crazy as we think it is. Adventure Time did get shot down by Nickelodeon twice when they were trying to get greenlit, maybe for similar reasons as to why these networks are doing this now. But we all collectively agree and acknowledge now that Nickelodeon screwed up big time by passing up Adventure Time. Like, we threw objective metrics. It was an L on their part. At least there is animation being made for broader audiences now by places outside of the main networks, you know, like Amazon Prime, Netflix. It, it's out there. There is a place for it. And Fiona and Cake are getting a series, so it's not all doom and gloom, right? Anyways, tell us your thoughts in the comments down below, and while you're down there, why don't you like the video, share it with your friends, maybe become a channel member, pledge to us on Patreon, and subscribe to Sugmail, follow my Twitch, TommyPQM, follow me on Twitter, TommyPQM, follow me on Instagram. Either way, thank you so much for watching, my name is Sam, I hope you have an awesome year, and I'll see you next time. See ya.